Good morning, Fox River! I was trying to see how long I can keep that river going. It, it ran out pretty, it ran out pretty quick. I want to start off this morning by praying first. So you just bow your head and close your eyes with me. Father, we thank you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are in this place to move up and down every row, each, every aisle. Touch, heal, deliver today, Father. Touch hearts, minds, and souls today, Father. Open ears that have been closed and open eyes that have been shut that they may see your word and see you and everything that we say today. I thank you right now for your word. I thank you for your people here today. And I thank you that the word shall go forth and be an impartation in our heart that will change our lives forever. We thank you right now in Jesus' mighty name and all those who agree say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. My name is Ed Cook. I am the pastor of Revive, a life transformation church here in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And one of my models and one of our goals is this is who we are is we're a place where love people love people. We keep hearing about where hurt people hurt people. Well, how about when you get some love people? What do love people do? They actually love on people. Our vision really is to connect people to Jesus, their purpose, and back to the community that they serve. And we want to do that in a Christ-centered, multi-ethnic church in the Milwaukee area that also serves families with and without special needs. So that's cognitive or physical special needs. Here, I want to just introduce you guys to my, 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 my family, my wife, my children. I don't know if they put them on the board yet, but my wife, Michelle, we have been married for 21 years now. Woo, woo. <laughs> well, oh, there they go. So that's her in the bottom right hand corner. Right next to her is my son. He's 16 right now, a budding entrepreneur, has a cool little shirt line that he's coming out with. And it's it's an I am line that has positive expressions for each of, for people um, to just positive affirmations for us and each other. And then that's my daughter right next to me. My daughter's Jordan. She is 14. And I like to say she is recovering from autism, but she's been diagnosed with autism, and that's where part of my heart is for our church, is to be able to serve families with and without special needs, because, hey, when I was younger and serving in church, my family couldn't come to church simply because they did not have a place or space that would actually serve my daughter, and so I was there, my family was at home, and so as God was putting it on my heart to open this ministry, he really put it on my heart to make sure we're taking care of families that have been not necessarily been focused on, or I won't say ignored, but could be that. <laughs> so I, I just want to say this one thing. Anytime that I come and stand in God's pulpit, I promised him that I will challenge our people. I will push us. I will, I will, I will rattle us just a little bit. I always say I never preach a message to get invited back, so they let me come back today. So I guess it was all right last night. <laughs> they let me come back. But what I want to say is as you listen to this message today, I want to challenge each of you to you should be hearing two voices. You will hear my voice, but I challenge you to open your hearts and mind to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I may not speak directly to your situation, but the Holy Spirit knows everything about you. And the Holy Spirit will be directing, moving, and guiding as I speak. And so I, I challenge you to listen to the Spirit today. What you guys have been talking about is following is filled with highs and lows. I will say this. High, our life is filled with highs and lows. And oftentimes the highs are, hey, everything's working out just how I want it. I prayed and it happened. Jesus, you're great. It showed up. Things are going great in my life. And then sometimes the lows are those times I'm inconvenienced, those times that I'm uncomfortable, those times that things just happened that I wasn't expecting, you know, I got to pay for something I wasn't expecting to pay for or something happened in my life that wasn't, that wasn't supposed to happen. But here's where I want to, to talk about our faith because too often what happens is when we come to Jesus and we walk into our faith, Instead of our faith helping to keep us out of those lows, we, roll, we go the same up and down our life and our faith parallel. 
in those highs and lows. And I believe God has given us answers to not go on these roller coasters on, in our faith in these highs and lows that are going to happen in our life. That's why today I'm going to talk about the power in giving thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 and 18, God says this, rejoice always. So he said, always be happy. I don't want to always be happy. He said, rejoice always, pray continually. And I, I, I pray great when things are going well, but sometimes when they're not going well, I don't want to pray as much, even though that's the time I should be actually praying. Pray continually. And here's, I think, the key to this. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. I think that's the key to all of this, is for us to get to a place in our life where we can give thanks in all all circumstances. Giving thanks is really a sign of appreciation. Giving thanks is saying, hey, God, I, I, there's something good that I can find in this situation. And the problem with this statement that I find is most people, when they read, give thanks in all things, we misinterpret that to give thanks for all things. You see, I am not thankful for all things. But in that thing, I can be thankful. My father passed away when he was 67 years old from complications from a stroke. And it was the first funeral I ever had to preach. Think about that. The first funeral. I, I wasn't thankful for him leaving. But when I looked around that room and I saw the people that he touched and I saw all the lives that he affected for the better, in that moment, I began to give thanks in that thing. Because giving thanks in it helped me get through it, helped me, helped me um, get focused on who he was and the impact that he had on this earth. I remember when I met my wife, me and my wife met on the phone. Long story, can't tell it here. <laughs> we met on the phone. And the job, I was in Ohio, she was here, and they closed that company. I was not thankful for losing my job. But as a result, I moved back closer to here. I was in Ohio. She was in Wisconsin. I moved back to Indiana. We got together. All 21 years later, we got two great kids. I wasn't thankful for it, but I was thankful in it. See, I truly believe that if you look back over your last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, there's going to be situations that you hurt. There are going to be things that happened that were really concerning to you. And in that moment, in the moment, it was, it was really hard for you. But if you look back, you could say, you know what? If this didn't happen, then I wouldn't have known this. And if that didn't happen, then I wouldn't have been here. I was uncomfortable right here, but now that I've gotten through that thing, I can look back and see where I grew through it instead of just going through it. And so, and so by, here's the thing. If I'm not giving thanks by our very nature as humans, what do I do? I complain. I find reasons to complain. I find reasons to be upset. I find things that are wrong. And here's the problem with complaining. I did, I did a little research, guys, and what happens is when we complain, there's a stress hormone that's released in our body called cortisol. And what cortisol does is it takes my blood, my oxygen, my energy, and it moves it into this survival mode. So my complaining puts me into survival mode. I got to win. I, gotta be I, I can't be defeated. I got to come out on top. And what happens is in survival mode, there's two things. It's fight or flight. In fight mode, what do I do? I externalize everything, and I'm seeking out an enemy to fight. I'm seeking out somebody to fight. You ever been to a restaurant with a person who uh, didn't like the meal and they were, well, I want the manager, the supervisor, the supervisor, supervisor, and the supervisor, supervisor, supervisor's boss. I want to see everybody because this mashed potatoes was cold. <laughs> and they are, they're externalizing. They are, they, they just, and then here's the thing. They keep reliving it in their head because if you ask them about that restaurant three weeks later, they're going to relive it about, I hate that place. Because they messed up my mashed potatoes. They gave me one pat of butter when I asked for two. And so, any, and here's the thing, in fight mode, anyone who doesn't agree with me then becomes my enemy. In fight mode, I'm only looking for people to agree. I'm only looking for allies 
to agree with me in fight mode. Anyone who tries to reason or rationalize with me in fight mode, you're go I'm going to turn on you because have you ever tried to reason with somebody who's ready to pick a fight? <laughs> hey, calm down. No, you calm down. <laughs> no, it's going to be all right. No, it's not going to be all right. <laughs> Why? Because I just want, if you're not going to be my ally, don't talk to me. If you're not going to be on my side, you ever got into a fight with a spouse or somebody close to you and they're like, but if you look at this, are you on my side or not? <laughs> those are those rationalizations that we can't do it. And like I said, we enter in this cycle of repeating it and reliving it. The other, the other mode that we go into is flight mode. We're running. Flight mode is really interesting because I internalize everything. And sometimes the enemy becomes other people, and sometimes that enemy becomes myself. You see, when the enemy's other people, then I'm, I'm really, I'm at this place where uh, I, I run from the problem instead of facing it. I'm at this place where I respond to you passive aggressively. I may, I may respond to you, but I'm not going to give you my all. If I don't like you and I work with you, I'm, I'm going to always be watching you. I'm always, everything that you do, I'm looking at you side, I, I'm flight. I won't confront the situation, but I won't give you my all. I, will, I won't set you up to win. I'll always set you up to try to fail. But here's a dangerous one. When we're in flight mode, we sometimes we turn it on ourselves. Anybody ever say, I wish I would have answered this, through, I wish I would have done this differently. I wish I would have answered this a different way. I wish this would have happened. I wish I was stronger. I wish I was better. I wish, I wish, I wish I was X, Y, and Z. And then we get into this place of self-hatred and we get into this place of depression because not, we, we turn our visceral thoughts and our visceral words and we turn them on ourselves. And we can't get out of it. Because we keep repeating the story. We repeat it and turn it on ourselves, and we go deeper and deeper and deeper. And yeah, we have our highs in life, but we start to make our lows even lower as we turn the fight on others and as we turn it on ourselves. You see, in survival mode, we do not, we do not walk in love or joy or peace, or forbearance, or kindness, or goodness, or faithfulness, or gentleness, or self-control. You want to know what I just read? The fruit of the Spirit, the character of God. In survival mode, I'm not loving, I'm fighting. I don't have any peace when I'm in survival mode. I don't, I don't have any kindness or goodness. I, sin, I don't even have goodness towards myself if I'm in flight mode. You see, we just want to win the fight, even if the fight is against ourselves. See, the problem when we complain is this. The only thing that I can ever see is what's wrong. When the will of God for us is to give thanks and focus on what's right. The only thing I can ever point out about God is what God hasn't done instead of looking at seeing what God has done. The only thing I can do is point at my spouse or my kids or relatives or my job or my coworkers, and I can tell you everything that they haven't done, but can I tell you everything that they have done? You see, when we start to focus on the good things, it actually changes our perception. It, I, I would even go as far as saying we actually start to introduce God in the situation when we operate in love because the Bible tells me in 1 John that God is love. But when I'm in survival mode, I am not acting in love. I'm acting in self-interest. And so now I can introduce God into that situation when I introduce love. I want to I I show you how Jesus handled this. We're going to go to Mark chapter 8, verse 1 through 9. Let's look how Jesus answered it. He said, in the NIV, it says, During these days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, 
I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Could you imagine being out in the middle of nowhere just listening to a dude talk for three days? If I was up here for another hour, would it be a couple fingers like, I'm out. <laughs> uh, guy, look at the time on this dude. He's, uh, he's going to. No, but we were out there for three days with nothing to eat. They was fasting and listening to him talk. He said, if I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. Now watch how we would normally respond and watch how the disciples responded. They said, the Bible responded, but where in the remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? We don't have the means to make bread, and we're out in the middle of nowhere, and we don't have the means to catch fish or have any food. How are we going to feed them? The next thing that came out, verse 5, how many loaves do you have, Jesus asked Seven, they replied. Now, I want to give y'all some. It'll tell us later there was 4,000 people who were actually there. Now, we got my, my loaves and my fish here. If I said, hey, y'all, we're going to have a fish fry after church, we don't, got no, we don't got no french fries, no potato cakes, no coleslaw. We just going to have fish and bread, and everybody in here is going to get full. And then I walked back there and said, you got seven of these and two of these. Make it enough. <laughs> There will be, the first thing the staff is going to say was, when you're going to get some more? Because there's no way. With what I have right here, I may can feed about four. I may get a good three or four sandwiches for right over here, and everybody else is going to just have to watch them eat. <laughs> because there's no way with these two fish and five loaves, or seven loaves, that we're going to be able to feed 4,000 people. But I want you to know the disciples defaulted to what we don't have. And what question did Jesus ask? Jesus asked, what do we have? Verse 6, he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken seven loaves and did what? Given thanks. He took what wasn't enough. He took what was a deficit. He took where he, he just, he took what he had and he gave thanks for what he had. He didn't complain. He didn't, he didn't groan. He didn't mumble. He didn't grovel about what we did. And y'all didn't bring enough. I told y'all these people were going to come out here. You should have had more. He didn't do anything. He just said, what do we have? And he took what he had and he picked up a loaf of bread. And the first thing he did was gave thanks. Other, other, other translations will say he gave thanks and he blessed it, meaning he spoke well of what he had. He gave thanks. He broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. And what did he do? When he got the small fish, he picked up the little fishy wishies, and he said, thank you, Father, for what we have. He said, thank you, and he distributed it. The people ate and were satisfied. They didn't just get a taste, they were satisfied. Afterwards, disciples picked up seven baskets fulls of broken pieces that were left over, and they fed about 4,000 pieces. There is a fun, there's some fundamental thing that I want to address here. Jesus said, what do we have? We always look for what we don't have. See, I was reading a book called The Compound Effect, and he was talking about he was him and his wife were having some issues, and they were having marital issues, and all he can look at was what was wrong with her and what she wasn't doing and who she wasn't and who he wanted her to be. And what he did was in, with some intention, and I'm going to challenge us, with some intention. If there's some places in your life right now where you're mad at God, your spouse, your kids, your work, whatever it is that is disgruntling you or turning you right now, I challenge us right now. Now, to have a little bit of intention about taking the next 30 days and finding just one thing every day as good. I find one thing every day that I can be thankful about. One thing, because what happened was he was having these issues and then he refocused and found one thing about his spouse every day. 
And what turned from a, a, a situation where they were having issues and were potentially going to get divorced, now they love each other more than they ever did. Why? Because when I start to focus on what's right, I change how I treat you. When I start to focus on right, I change how I treat me. When I start to focus on what's right, it changes the whole atmosphere. I have a personal story behind this. There was a job, who it was about 20-something years ago now, and I went into this job, and you know I was the hot shot. Yeah, I know this, and I got this, and I got floored really quickly. And I go into this job, and I had a trainer and a supervisor who really rode me really, really hard. Anything that I did, it was almost, it wasn't quite a write-up. I did get written up once over something I couldn't control, but it was almost a write-up. I dreaded going in there every day. I walked up into the door and my heart beat fast because the job was a 12-hour job and if it, it was a tough job for me to do already without the extra pressure and without the extra stress of coworkers who really wasn't there for me. And one day I was at a family event and someone said, how's the job? And I said, I hate it. It sucks. These people don't, they don't like me. They're not really training me. They pick on me for everything. I, I, I don't know why they're against me and I hate this job. And I said it several times. And my uncle came and pulled me to the side and he said, hey, let me ask you a question. I said, what's up, Unc? He said, hey, if your family, if you lost your job today, could you feed your family? He said, if you lost your job today, would you be able to feed and take care of your family? And I said, no. And you know what he said? Stop speaking death on that job because one day you won't have it if you keep speaking death. From that moment, I was, it, it changed me because I would walk up to the door every day and I would go, today is going to be a good day. I thank you, God, for this job. I thank you for the opportunity to take care of my family today. Today is going to be a good day. And I would get to the door, and I, it didn't happen right away. But after about two weeks, it actually started to happen. To, the day started becoming good days because when I was walking in focused on it already being a bad day, I had a bad attitude walking in the door. But when I walked in and said today's going to be a good day, it changed my attitude and changed how I perceived people were talking to me. See, sometimes people will talk to you and you don't like it because your perception of why they're saying it. Sometimes people are getting you just to are talking to you to help you grow. But if you go into it with a bad attitude, you won't ever grow because you will say, I don't like them, but if I, and they don't like me, so why would they say that to me? And they say that like this. But if you change your perception and what they're telling you, quite possibly they're giving you something that's going to help you be better the next day. You see, my favorite, my favorite line is, live in the dream. You'll hear me say that often. And when I would go to work, I would say Monday mornings is my favorite day of the week. Now, how many of you want to laugh at that? I know. <laughs> Nobody likes Monday mornings, but Monday mornings is my favorite day of the week. Why? Because, and I'll tell people that and go, ha, 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 I wish I had another day or two. And we always going to wish we had another day. We get a week off and then wish we had another day. <laughs> We get a two weeks off and then wish we had another day. So we're always going to wish we had another day. And I walk in and I told him, I said, when I put my badge down on here, guess what? The door is open. And on the 15th and the 31st, money magically just appeared in my account. It gave me the opportunity to take care of my family. If I walked out of this job today, there will be 100 people who wanted this job to be able to take care of their family. You see, I've been married for 21 years, and I have a wonderful wife. And I say that confidently. I don't say that, you know, some people get up here and be like, my wife, wonderful. <laughs> no, I have a wonderful wife, and I have great children, and I have a house to live in. And I walk in, and I hit this little button on the wall, and the heat or the cool air comes on. Would you imagine? My wife was just in Peru um, doing a missions trip, and she's going in, people are living in concrete boxes. They don't have buttons on the wall to make their heat go up and down. They just got to deal with it. 
I go in the house, I open my fridge and, refri and food is there. I open my cupboard and food is there. I get in my car and push a button and it starts. And it goes forward or backwards based on another button that I push. I go in my closet and I got a whole lot of clothes. And I'm looking, and as my wife was in Peru, she said there was some people who the only clothes they had was what was on their back. And maybe they had another outfit or two or three in their closet, and that's it. And we go to our closet with a closet full of clothes. And we got the nerve to say, I don't got nothing to wear. <laughs> you don't have anything you want to wear, but there are people who literally don't have anything to wear. How about we go in our closet and say, God, thank you, I got choices. God, thank you that there's something here for me. Even I'll figure, I'll put it together, God, but thank you. I got more than one or two choices. You see, I get to drive over bridges that other people are, are sleeping under. When I say I'm living the dream, it's just a reminder to me that you know what? There are people sleeping under bridges right now that don't wish they were rich. They don't wish they were Bill Gates. They simply wish they had my life. Is my life perfect? Absolutely not. But they just wish they had my life. I'm thankful. Can we find a reason to give thanks today? Can we find just one thing? You breathe in, you got here. Can we find a reason simply to give thanks today? In this moment, could you do me a favor and just close your eyes and bow your head with me for a moment? Some of you may find it hard to say thankful, to say thank you in any area of your life right now. And I understand, I get it. But there's one universal thing we can all say thank you is that God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus not only to be example of how we live and not go through the highs and lows, but also he sent a sacrifice for our death, through death, that we may be reconciled with Jesus, with God. He died so you could live life to the full in abundance till it, only, till it overflows. And the only true way to do that is to surrender. If you never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you've never surrendered, if you've never, we've complained about everything, but if you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and you've never just surrendered to the call of Christ that is on you and you want to do that today, you, wanna, you want salvation today, you want to be reconciled with God, you want to live that life to the full and abundance till it overflows. And I'm not talking about material things, but I'm talking about in my mind and in my heart. If you want that today and you want salvation Raise your hand for me today. Hallelujah. Holla, I see you guys out there. I see you. If you're that person today that needs to be reconciled, you're at this crossroads. Of, do I still want to do this Jesus thing or not? Do I still want to go down this road or not? I say it's worth it. And if you want to reconcile, you want to come back to Jesus today. Can you raise your hand for me today? Hallelujah, I see you, I see you, I see you. Thank you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus for the opportunity to say thank you. I thank you right now in the name of Jesus for every hand that raised up today, every heart that's, that's surrendering today. I pray, Father, that we, we, we as a community just come around them and love on them and help them. I thank you for this word today that the impartation will go in our hearts and we'll start to live a thankful life each and every day. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.